Welcome back to the Cyberspace Podcast by Empirical Training. Um, you might be coming back to listen to us yet again. If so, welcome. Uh, if this is the first time, a little bit about who we are and what this is. Cyberspace is a great place where we get to talk about people's journeys into cybersecurity um, or general cybersecurity issues that interest us or just general education topics about, about areas in cybersecurity um, that, that we have had some experience in or more importantly, our expert guests uh, have some experience in. You might have seen us on the socials, TikTok, Instagram, so on, always trying to educate people. Our main goal at Empirical is to get people into cybersecurity because we've had great careers in there so far and are still still plowing on. Also some very unorthodox careers, right? Robbie the footballer or, or potential footballer. And myself almost became a lawyer um, and we really have Semi-pro a look I was. Semi-pro. So we want to we want to pull people other people along uh, for the journey, or we just want to help people stay secure and, and knowledgeable of what threats are out there, right? Because it's, it's everyone's data is more exposed than ever, and uh, there are easy steps that we can take if you have that little bit of know-how to make sure you're staying secure, safe, and, and private online. Uh, so Rob, as empirical training, trying to get people into the the jobs, we obviously have our school community, which has been growing massively. Uh, uh, thanks to everybody who kind of contributes to the discussion in there. Is there anything else that um, people need to know about that we've been working on? Yeah, big up everybody in the free school community. It is, uh, yeah, it's going really well. People are really, really enjoying all the free content we got, the free pathway. We've got the zero to senior cybersecurity analysts. We've got the skills matrix, I think, that you can grab in there as well, as long as you contribute. And then we're building out our first paid tier, which is the gold tier. And that has all of the additional content that you guys are going to be able to ingest and take in to give you those necessary skills to break into that first junior SOC analyst role. So yeah, all of our content right now is aimed towards that blue team defensive role. And the gold tier is just one of our paid tiers that we're going to be creating. We do have another one, but I'm not going to talk about that. Shh, right hold now. We'll, save that. we'll save that for <laughs> another one, but it's more content more juicy yes. stuff but yeah man just been finishing off some of the content for the gold tier the, the evidence portfolio stuff because we're, we're trying to take another little angle um in regards to uh showcasing the knowledge that you've gained and like i think i think it's a really good idea to promote this evidence portfolio pack that you can create and you can showcase what you've learned you can literally i don't know you write in process documents you're screen recording some things that you've that, that you've uh that you've gone through in terms of the content or maybe there's some like practical elements that you can screen record and you know gather this digital evidence pack and send it off as an attachment alongside your cv why not let's let's try something different it's one thing saying that you've sat and then passed an exam but you might have lost all of that knowledge you know anyone anybody can cram for an exam but yeah we're, we're trying something a little different hopefully it works out but um yeah, today's I, not about think... us today is uh about our guest that we've got on <laughs> and uh is another fellow creator in the space a tiktoker master of DevSecOps, cyber charlie let's bring him to the stage Ooh, welcome, Charlie. Cyber Charlie, that's a pretty cool name. I wish there was a, a, another appendix I could put on the front of Josh to make myself sound as cool as that. I know. <laughs> I'm glad no one else, actually, no, someone had taken it and I had to add a four to it or something as the actual name for that. You know, there oh. we go. No, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the real deal he's a, he's a yeah yeah that's it. <laughs> it up, they'll, be, they'll be trying to sell it to you before long i'm sure <laughs> that's it <laughs> but, uh, but charlie charlie's a, a fellow you know creator in the kind of security uh, space i think that that's how we kind of met right and robbie and charlie connected um on, on there uh, really liking the stuff that you're doing um it kind of really complements some of the pieces with it. your niche is right it's focused on that the development piece right security within development and secure building so is that yeah. security engineering is that kind of what the what, i know people have different names for it what would you say yeah and this is this is the interesting thing with devsecops in this space everyone calls it a different thing everyone has a different mm. view on what, and you know other areas of cyber are quite clear cut but with this space it's not 
And I find when, even when I go to interview and things like that, I have to kind of educate and explain to people, well, this is what DevSecOps is. This is what I can do. This is how I can lay it out. And I think, yeah, there is a lot of kind of uh, lack of education around what is true DevSecOps, uh, what is security engineering? Does it include cloud security? Is it all about the software development lifecycle, et cetera? And, or is it security engineering? Is it just engineer or is it just the new cyber? So um, yeah, as I'm sure we'll get into a lot of this today. That, that new cyber is really interesting. But yeah, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna park it for now because we will definitely do a whole session dedicated just on DevSecOps because it's uh, mm -hmm. there's so much to un unpack and talk about there. But first of all, we really like to kind of share the different journeys people have had. So people who are trying to get into cybersecurity, kind of see themselves maybe in some of the steps that you've taken. Uh, if there's anything we've we've learned, the only consistency in these journeys is the kind of unorthodox nature of it. You know, being ready for different opportunities, um, a little bit of luck, a little bit of chance, but kind of being ready with with uh, eyes wide open to take these opportunities. Um, and I, maybe I'm preempting you, or maybe this is completely uh, uh, not not your journey. But we would really love to understand how you got into security or even how you got into uh, mm. tech and what that looked like. Yeah, mm, take yeah. us back to the very start. Very start. So um, my undergrad degree was in politics. Uh, I didn't really have an interest in politics. And after my A-levels, I was kind of like everyone else. I was, I say, following the sheep as in like, well, now I just go to uni, right? I didn't really have any direction of what I was going to do. Um, during my politics degree, I was quite interested in defense and security in general, right? So like... My dissertation was on the 2010 defense review, um, but it was a more focused on kind of military defense. But parts of cyber started kind of creeping in then at that level it, within within the military. Um, so then I, I, I kind of started doing some research whilst in my undergrad. Um, but at the time, there wasn't really many cyber degrees. Obviously, Royal Holloway were kind of renowned for their one. Right. Um, but I wasn't quite sure if that was where I wanted to go. So. I started kind of researching, et cetera, in my undergrad. And then again, I was kind of like, still, I'm not going to get a job with a politics degree. But, you know, I, and I accept I didn't have a skill that was really useful for anyone. Um, so I, I wasn't ready to go out to market. So I decided to do a master's degree. Um, mm. That I did at King's College in intelligence and international security. So again, kind of the, the military intelligence side, because it just interested me. And that was kind of where I wanted to go. But again, I, I think everyone in that space thinks, OK, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll go down the civil service fast stream, uh, if, if you're familiar with that. And then, like, you know, I'll end up going to work for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office or going to, you know, do all this really cool stuff as an ambassador. Then you end up getting, you know, stuck in the Department for Work and Pension. I've had loads of really awful <laughs> stories. So I kind of got put off that that journey. Uh, so then, then I was yeah. in during my master's degree, I was we got to choose what modules we would like to do. And they were like, oh, we're just trialing out a kind of cyber module. Um, and at the time, there was this guy that was leading it. And it was like, it, at that point, they weren't willing to do a full degree out of it, right? And kind of no one was. Um, so it was at this point, I was like, I like begged the lecturer, literally emailed him. I was like, look, I don't have a tech background, but I really want to learn. I see this is going to be the latest new thing. Can you let me sit in on the modules and like actually put it down? Um, and after meeting him and a bit of convincing, and it was like the most oversubscribed module at the time. They're only they were only taking on twenty students at the five hundred in the year to do this side module. Um, wow. And he convinced me to let to let me go on it. And then so, but I was not technical. Didn't know much about computers. In truth, I wasn't like you know couldn't code nothing like that. And that was when I kind of started my journey. And I was like, right. This I could see from like the kind of government side and what happened was happening with companies and the kind of public breaches that actually this is going to new, be the new space. And then I just decided to make that big jump. And I think it's an interesting jump because I didn't have a previous tech background, right? Like I wasn't, you know, I kind of went into cyber wanting to get into cyber. Um, and then it was all a bit crazy. I, I did that, just that module. And, um, and then I got a role while still studying it, actually. Um, I went and interviewed for a defense company um, for, um, and they kind of like the, the security side as well. Um, and then I became a cybersecurity consultant for this defense company. Mm. Interesting. There's a lot of nice. things I kind of resonate with, with there. You know, I, mm. I was in the law pathway in university. Ah, right. Yeah. Similar, yeah. For similar reasons. It was that kind of almost yeah. that cookie cutter future that was ahead of me and competing mm. with so many people and kind of, not yeah. having a whole lot of agency over your own destiny that made me think yeah. that's not for me and i had a module international law conflict and strategy that kind of showed me um a taste of the, what was the cyber security and the, the yeah. gray area of cyber security what really yeah. excited me i didn't I want it to be something that wasn't all that thought out 
just yet at, at the time and it's still not mm. it evolves too quick right for us to get a real grip mm. over it mm. but that's super interesting you kind of came from there you knew the high level principles of what it is that you could probably should be doing or need to be doing or the implications yeah. of yeah. you don't do the right security things and then you're like okay now let's work out how to do those things yes exactly right and i think it was and it, it was interesting because the moment i started learning it for the first time in my life i felt like i had a trade so it was like an actual thing that was worth money and use to someone. Whereas like, obviously, you know, studying a generic topic, et cetera, it's like, how am I worth anything to anyone? If, if that makes sense, you know, like becoming a, for example, becoming a plumber, you're going to be worth someone, you know, people need plumbing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it was like, for the first time ever, I was studying something that wasn't like kind of generic social sciences. It was like, this has a future actually in. Um, I wish I'd learned a lot of this prior because I could have spent, three years in my politics degree, actually learning more in cyber, et cetera. And, you know, and I regret not doing that earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, especially all those kind of, you know, these, these degrees these days, you only go in a few weeks, a few days of the week, et cetera. Right. I could have spent so much of that time really upskilling because I didn't, re you, you only know what you know. Right. And um, I didn't realize that I could learn all this stuff for free. I could teach my, you know, I could have created an amazing CV. If I knew what I did know now back then, I could have done it all quicker and a lot better. Um, so I think totally. like what you guys do, what I'm trying to do is just like, this is how you do it, right? It's not, it's, yeah, it's not a big secret. You can do all this stuff. There's no barrier. And like I always say about the barriers to entry, it's, yeah. cr I like, I still can't believe it. There's no barriers to entry, right? Like it's the, and I say to my students, I say, it all comes down to what the hiring manager of the company you want to go to. You don't technically need a degree. You don't need, there's not one thing like, you know, like law, right? You need to pass the bar. You need to, you know, there's things you absolutely oh, yeah. need. You even be considered. Jump like, through that one, jump through this one. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, you've got to go through these two. Like in this space, there isn't, and no one's yet agreed on what is the cyber cert you need as well, right? There's no like, there's no True. wide degree what you need to get. Everyone's got different views, different opinions, etc. And it ultimately comes down to, when you interview for that person, what is it they want to see and how do you come across? Yeah. And that's why it's so easy to get into from any other industry in my view. Um, but that's um, interesting. Robbie, you have been a hiring manager a lot and that's obviously a lot of the experience mm -hmm. we draw on to kind of help what, what, what the direction to go in. Is yeah. something Charlie just said there, there's no kind of prescribed pathway. Have you seen any consistent like common denominators between the people that you've hired that have been good analysts or has it really been so varied that you almost couldn't, you know, really, really count a kind of common path that they take and that, that unifies them? Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. I, I think it's been, I think it's been varied for me. I, I've interviewed a lot of people and everyone's got different experience and, and had their own um, like route to that specific interview on that day. And I, th I think just the common denominator of uh like a characteristic trait that, that i always go for is that is that like a divergent thinker that mm -hmm. that, that curious person that wants to, to dive mm -hmm. a little deeper into the like like an analytical type of, of person that, that's willing mm -hmm. to go that extra mile to find that that finer detail and it's you know you, you can you can learn different aspects and different concepts of cyber security it's not about your current competency level it's it's you as a person it's like what makes you tick yeah. mm -hmm. what time are you getting out of bed every morning are you are you conscious about your diet are you looking after your body all, all of these things will will transfer nicely into them being a, a a good a good worker so i think it's um it's i think it's important to make sure that you've got your everything that you've got going on outside of work you've, you've got that nailed down and you're, you're really mm -hmm. looking within and and then you can prove to somebody that that you're going to be a, a really good worker but i think yeah in, in terms of certifications they've like like charlie was just mentioning then it's it's like the wild wild west no one really knows what what certs they they need obviously it's good if you've got some fundamental certs like some CompTIA, network plus security plus cys cysa um but and there's a, there's like blue team level one blue team level yeah. two and but yeah it's 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 a bit of a mixture isn't it it's, mm. it's almost like it's the most it, it's kind of a paradox that it's in some cases the most ungatekeep kept profession ever because mm -hmm. like you said you can find all this stuff on the internet you can learn so much yeah. open source mm. is really yeah. embodied on the internet right free culture that the, that the internet has mm. but if you don't know where to look that's kind of how it yeah. is gate, 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 what, yeah 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 what, what is that yeah yeah but also there's 
there's a i've interviewed a lot of people that have gone through the university degree got their mm. the honors degree in computer science or information security or whatever it may be and then maybe they've done a master's as well and they come mm. almost expecting to get the role mm. yeah, because yeah, yeah. well i'm in 60 grand's worth of debt right now yeah. <laughs> and i've learned xyz in yeah. uni and, and on my master's i deserve this job and yeah. unfortunately you yeah. don't because they kind of do miss yeah. out quite a lot of concepts yes. and um yeah. i do, <laughs> and I, do have a theory, I do have a theory on this um it's like yeah. controversial but i feel like uh, so obviously all the universities are like right we've got to create cyber degrees now you know it's new latest thing right how did they come mm. about creating their content and who did they engage to create it now a lot of lecturers are teachers by profession and they learn things to teach things right so if the you know the in terms of things like teaching DevSecOps etc you kind of have to be in that field to understand to be able to teach it right yeah. so it, and it's a similar thing with a lot of the generic cyber certifications what, what I call them is that actually yes it's great teaching them the theory and case studies etc but how useful is that in actually doing the job and delivering on the role and i think there's a big disconnect and i think part of the problem is the best people that do this stuff won't be willing to take a kind of lecturer's salary they'll be instead working for the big banks contract you know doing it so it's like you lack those really good people that could educate they're not in that university system so as a result the degrees are kind of full of padding in some respects of things that actually so when someone comes to me and has done a degree in cyber I'm like, but yeah, but can you deploy this? Can you do this? Do you know how to? And it's like, no, because actually it's, it's so far from the day-to-day -day role that you have to end up upskilling them anyway. So, you, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that parallel when you said that you learned a trade because it is, it's, it, though it's, mm. it is behind a computer desk or screen, mm. you are mm. very much doing things, creating, building, which is kind of where that, that parallel is more like yeah. um, less wishy-washy head in the books. It's more actually doing, testing, breaking things, fixing things. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good example. I've not heard that one before. Um, I also have a little chuckle because I wrote down diet here robbie when you said that was one of the the key things and i was just thinking all the, the different people i've worked with in cyber security i wouldn't say that <laughs> maybe yeah maybe that's a little bit just niche for me because um because that's something that that that, that i no, find important i get it discipline you said what discipline yeah discipline, no, yeah yeah that's it it can be rounded up into into discipline doesn't it? you don't have yeah. to have a good diet to get into cyber security i, I do i agree what you were saying because it's it's more like so sometimes sometimes i can interview someone within the first few minutes and no, I'm going to hire them based yeah. on, you know, because like you said, they can learn all these things. And usually I create people a path to actually go and learn those things. But if they are likable, going to be able to get on with key stakeholders, have some, you know, hold their own in terms of talking about some technical things, etc. I would rather hire that person, particularly in a DevSecOps role. And I'll, I'll come on to it later. Why? Because you have to do so much engagement with other teams and winning people over, etc. Mm. That for me is a more important skill. If they're willing to learn and have the motivation and they have the confidence, et cetera, that you, cause you can't really teach that. Right. So it's like, if they have that in themselves, so I kind of see what you're saying. So it's more like at the personal level as a hiring manager, do you get on with them? And yeah. when I interview, I always come up with a story to say in the first, like if I'm interviewing for a role, for example, I'll always say like, come up with something just to break the, you know, develop some rapport with the interviewer straight away. And I love yeah. it when people yeah. do that with me when I'm the other side as well, cause it's like, makes me feel relaxed, makes me think, well, I can work with this person. But that's not a technical skill. That's not what a certification proves, right? Um, so yeah, I totally get yeah. that. Create that yeah, conversation like, rather like, than the, the Q and A. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, it. Exactly. I, I like um, I like throwing them off with just a, a random competency-based <laughs> question. I, I like I like I like this one, and it's what's the smallest thing that makes you the happiest? And then it like and then, and then I say try and answer as quickly as you can. Don't really take thinking. a minute. Don't yeah, don't overthink it at all. Yeah. Just what's the smallest thing in life sugar. that makes you that? Yeah, it could be sugar. Yeah, <laughs> like my example, because if some people are struggling, I have to help them along with it. And mm -hmm. my example is when I go home, back to my mum's house. There's loads of cats. We've got like seven cats, and <laughs> I open up one of the side doors and I whistle like a dog, and one of the big fat black cats runs in at, like at my beck and call. And it's just, just this the tiniest thing in life that when I do that, I do my little whistle and she comes around and she knows it's me. Yeah, yeah. And then some people say, some people have said showers, pizza, like you just get random. And then, 
I was thinking yeah. of the size of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but then you can sort of dissect that and ask them why and then dig a little mm. deeper into their lives mm. and what makes them tick. And mm. yeah, that's mm. important to get to know them, isn't it? You want to get to know them because mm. it's really hard to convey um how like what you are as a mm. who you are as a person and, mm. and 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 how you're going to benefit the company and the team that you're gonna mm. slot into and mm. all mm. these things. It, it's hard and mm. yeah, sometimes you hire good people, sometimes you get bad hires and yeah, they don't stay for a long time. I ideally want to keep people for as long as possible and yeah, that never happens because everyone just yeah. goes their their own way at some point. Mm. That's just yeah. the, the nature of life. But, but mm. on that on that lovely layup in getting to know people better, Charlie, we got you in your first job role of uh a security company as in a, as in a, a military defense company right and you are mm -hmm. now a, a what consultant sorry uh well i became a senior cybersecurity consultant mm -hmm. so the, the focus was very much i would be part of a managed service embedded into uh, to start with government departments doing cybersecurity and then also financial organizations part of that but the kind of first part of my career was consulting very much you go in you do your kind of gap assessments, put together strategies, lots of high level work, but you don't really get into the lower level of detail. So the good thing about this was actually, and I did a lot of auditing of loads of different companies all across the UK as part of that journey. So I got to see probably the best part of how 100 organizations did cyber security through that consulting experience. But mm -hmm. you don't own anything end to end in a consulting role, right? You put together, you package something up, you deliver it. But you don't own it at the end so you never really get to see it and own it and it's not until you work for what i call end user organizations either the clients or the consultants where you really get to see it from a different side and get to that level of detail and i do like the fact that i did the consulting stuff first because i kind of got to saw work out my own what looks good if that makes sense and it gave me loads of experience across those different areas but then i was like i had this kind of eureka moment i was like i need to get into more detail now i need to upskill myself and then i from seeing all those organizations I worked out the area to go into as a result of doing that within cyber. Mm. So your own gap analysis almost of what these companies needed yeah. and then where they would yeah. potentially fork out the most money to kind of fill. And, and yeah. I guess you yeah. probably had a lot of, you talked about stakeholder management as well. As a mm. consultant, you probably got a lot of different stakeholders. Mm. Some of them don't know what to do in value help. Some of them are probably yeah. looking at you thinking, why on earth are we paying this kid? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> prove prove your worth <laughs> yeah that, yeah the, the day rates these consultancies put you out on is just oh. unbelievable when you see the rate the, the sheet <laughs> card it's like oh my god <laughs> how does yeah, that work but, does that yeah. put a lot of pressure on you when you know how um, much you're being charged out at um yeah yeah did really early on when i was in my first mm. role I, it was that i didn't quite understand why or how that works and then you see like the kind of very senior people that get put on ridiculous day rates and you're like well i'm doing all the work they just come in and sign it off mm. at the end of the engagement and they're charging themselves out you know um but yeah that that's quite that's quite fascinating where are we at with the timeline then what what year is this where are we now like uh 20 kind of between 2015 and 2019 i think yeah 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 i'd say around there okay and then pro probably 20 2016, 2017, I had the click moment of, I know what I need to learn based on supply and demand. So oh, I, I basically, from seeing all these organizations, seeing where I was going to go, um, I did have this other eureka moment, uh, which I'll, I'll go into as well. I realized what my kind of calling in cyber was going to be and where I was going to have the biggest impact. That was where my career went skyrocket. Like, you know, I saw the biggest difference. Yeah. yeah. Without, without and then to so you talk about you you made a plan how, how did you execute on that that training strategy then and where did you yeah. pull those so, resources so, from yeah absolutely so i had this moment where i was working for an organization and a devops engineer joined the business he was a contractor um and he kind of because he was a contractor he, he didn't so much um fit in with like the permanent side of the business as such but he's a really nice guy and because i was working on one of the projects as a cybersecurity consultant i just got speaking to him we just really got on and then he showed me what he was working on and he was doing this pipeline work and this was very early on in devsecops wasn't really a thing at this time 
Um, and he was doing these pipelines. He was playing with, with Jenkins at the time, um, doing stuff in Azure, um, and then like Terraform and things like this. And I was like, okay. And then he started teaching. And then I, I went home. And I go, right, I'm going to teach myself AWS because I did some research. And I kind of thought, well, you know, everyone's migrate at this point, everyone's migrating to AWS. And when I was in government, it was kind of like, everyone was having the debate of going to the cloud and Azure, but like everyone was really hesitant mm -hmm. back then, right? They were like, no, we can't have, even though everyone had been putting information in like rack space and things like that, which was kind of the same thing anyway, right? You weren't having your own mm -hmm. on-prem, but everyone's going, right, we can't afford to maintain on-prem. We've got loads of tech debt by having everything on-prem. We need to go to the cloud. So I was kind of in the midst of, of that journey. So I kind of sat down and I said, right, I'm just gonna create an AWS account and just build my own things. And that's what I did. I followed YouTube tutorials, built my own things. I um, started deploying my own things via Jenkins. I'd break everything. Very rarely did anything work. But I could hold, I then found I was holding conversations with people in the business I wouldn't usually speak to. And there's a big part of security not being technical. The amount of times I've gone into like cybersecurity teams in organizations and like they haven't gained the trust or respect of like developers or the cloud teams because actually they don't understand what they're doing or working on. So, and you need a really strong relationship between those areas. So the only way to get those is have like an appreciation of what they do. So it was at that moment, I thought, well, I downloaded Visual Studio Code. I started, you know, writing some really basic code, committing it to a GitHub repo, then understood how like merging to PRs worked and all those basics, but I never built a full application. I never learned a full programming language, but I just understood and taught myself like the engineers ways of working if that makes sense by like working with these engineers then i kind of thought well actually i think this is a thing i think actually we can integrate security in this way and so then i started playing with automating security tools as part of the the pipelines and things like that and then i embedded myself in software engineering teams doing security that was for me the moment where i was like this is a thing because then i saw the value i was providing those development teams by mm. sitting with them and learning. And then I packaged that up and then I went and sold myself during interviews with that offering essentially. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I, I did some work, uh, solution engineering at one point. Yeah, yeah, that's sales is the dark side, I know. I wasn't there long. But um, the difference with my conversations with the kind of developers um, in kind of saying, Here, here's what you need to be doing when they didn't have the feeling that I understood what their objectives were, you know, what they were doing, what they were trying to like, Kubernetes was the one that was really hot at the time. Um, mm. And, um, you know, you say, use the word pod or cluster incorrectly once, mm. and they don't want to hear anything yes. that you have yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah. You've lost them, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of, I can always see that, yeah, by, by embedding yourself in there, it's, it's, it's trust. So you know much about security is trust because I think a lot of people, you know, bad security is kind of the, the, the worst thing ever because it takes a lot of time to implement and it, it's, it, it gets in the way of things. And then it's kind of like a boy who cried wolf scenario. You don't want to go and, and do it again. So mm -hmm. earning up that credibility is, is really important to make to people to understand because mm -hmm. really they, they would get rid of you in a second if they, uh, if it's because they want to focus on building things and, and that's what they're, yes. they're, they're Passionate, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's all about, and that was kind of where I took the step back. So I kind of thought, okay, well, cyber and its reason to exist is very much about protecting the company. But the number one objective of the company is to make profit and build products, applications, and have them run, right? So how can you make sure that that's done as frictionless as possible whilst doing security? And that was kind of how I would sell DevSecOps was it was like, well, I'm not just going to automate your security and make that better in terms of your deployments and make sure your applications are built secure by design. But as a result, your DevOps best practices and you'll push more code, you, all those things will come together, which will help you make money as well. And that's another mm. thing I, I sell it as. That's why it's kind of a, a bit unique in the security space because actually you can provide more value than just security as well by doing DevSecOps. Awesome. awesome. And I, I know we're going to dive into DevSecOps in yeah, a lot sure. more depth, but i think we've mentioned it enough times now that i just want to if you give a quick kind of high level definition of, of it because it was very much a different way of thinking i'm glad you said it was a recent term of that by the time so i hadn't heard of it before i didn't know if i was just late to the party but uh yeah <laughs> give, give us a little, a little top level yeah high level review. so if you think of the, the kind of name DevSecOps, ops is development security operations and the idea and there's lots of different interpretations and people call it lots of i've seen like sec devops and loads of different versions of it but basically yeah, it means <laughs> yeah, it basically means we're combining security and development and operational practices or DevOps practices as well um, to the sense that we shift security left. So the idea is that 
when we build a new application, which most companies do, right, a new product, mobile app, you know, whatever it is, you don't want to be doing security as an afterthought. So you don't want it to, and I'm sure you've all had this in your careers as well. Someone comes to you and goes, oh, we launched a new app a couple of weeks ago. And you're like, well, why are you telling me this now, right? And, and then, then you have to bolt security on at the end, right, which costs more money. We could find things. That means we have to stop it from being public. It's just the worst place to do it. So the idea is that we shift security left of that process. If you think far right is we've deployed it and it's in production, left is we're coming up with the idea of building a new application. If you have security professionals at that position that early on in the kind of design phase of the application, you're going to save yourself so much time and money. And well, time is money, right? In making the application secure by design. And then there's certain steps that you would do as a DevSecOps engineer to do that through that kind of life cycle of that application. So that's what DevSecOps is. Yeah, and I love that. That was that you explained that so well that I saw the best metaphor in my head of, of DevSecOps <laughs> that I think I've ever ever thought of before. <laughs> for me, I'll say it's the best one ever. But um, <laughs> you know, future proof when you have um, a, a, an old house and you try and kind of make it eco friendly, like efficient, mm -hmm. energy efficient, you go and add on all the try and change, swap out the windows, you do all those things. It's a real headache. It's really difficult. Versus from the offset, having that goal and building yeah, yeah, in yeah. those types of uh, controls, exactly, insulation, yeah. etc. Yeah. Nice. So, so I got it. Mm. We understand what DevSecOps. That DevSec was a good metaphor. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that. <laughs> Let's post that on TikTok, then, guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clipped. <laughs> so, where, where are we now? So, you've 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 understood your background in politics. Understand the important the kind of role of of security mm. in, in politics mm. and and kind of just governing things. Mm. Then you've gone into the, your security consultancy mm. with a defense company. Then you're an architect right you are creating you're involved in the process of building uh, products and building security and from the beginning the dev sec ops mm -hmm. oh where, where so this is at this point you're fully embedded you said it's taken off now right um yeah yeah so yeah go on i was just gonna say go well, well, what's next <laughs> uh, yeah so, so then i'm in, i'm embedded i'm learning i'm proving my theories work so, so it's also about scalability. So I have a toolkit, a DevSecOps toolkit, which is basically all the things I've learned and the best practice that I look to apply to an organization. But every organization is different, okay? Now, the, the way I look at it, you have a target model you want to be, okay? So for example, if you were to build a new company tomorrow, right, what kind of tools and things would you use to do that? So say if you build a new company tomorrow that's going to deploy an application. So, well, I'm going to be cloud-based, right? I'm going to want to automate my deployments. I'm going to want to write it in infrastructure as code, and we're going to use container images. You know, when you think of all that technology around what should be tomorrow, you then think of, well, actually, these are the skill sets I need to make that secure, if that makes sense. And then these are the threats to that type of technology going forward. But not every organization is at that point. Right. So some companies obviously are either like new startups typically follow that model. Right. Because they've been established in the kind of last 10 years. The chance I'll be on AWS, such a older companies will obviously still have stuff on prem, might still be migrating. Maybe the new things they do are at that level. So when I approach companies, it's very much what's your maturity first, because then I can understand, well, actually, what's the toolkit that I can apply and how can I uh, kind of get the most impact out of what I want to do. And not only that, so for example, I've worked at organizations where I'll be the only DevSecOps engine, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my toolkit has to adapt in that model. If I don't have budget to build out a team, I then have to think, okay, well, I've got all these engineers. How can I upskill those? How can I make it fun? How can I shift security left? How can I have the biggest impact? Can I put like a DevSecOps champions program, for example, in place to upskill those engineers that are already interested in security? How can I get my kind of maximize my output and scalability based on the maturity of the organization, the size and what my kind of budget is, right? So I always have that kind of toolkit that I apply. And I've had experience of doing it directly myself versus I've gone in some organizations and been given very large budgets to build out very big DevSecOps teams and been able to scale massively and had a, a very different impact as a result of that. So I've, I've kind of done it that whole, you know, very senior levels, lower levels, and kind of it it changes per organization that you work in. There's not really a model that fits all. It all depends on the lay of the land of the organization. Hmm. Just right, quickly so on the um, on the programming side of things, you said in the beginning you were on um, like Visual Visual Studio Code, yeah. and you were doing some basic programming. Yeah. What 
where you're at in terms of your like competency level in uh, in coding and programming at this point is it part of the job or is, is no it, is, no. is it as so, important as people think it is so so back then it wasn't part of the job i had to do it myself if i wanted to gain the respect of the engineers that i'm working with so so one of the common problems not problems as such but when you go into like a dev secops role and i'm sure you, you'll see in other roles in your careers there'll be some individuals in the business that will kind of be like oh hang on a sec i'm doing that you know you, you'll get like cloud engineers or like develop and you get a lot of developers that are like we're secure enough we don't you know so those people you have to develop rapport with and gain their trust so the only way i really felt i could do that was if i taught myself these things now it wasn't part of my job right i didn't need to do it in my role at the time but i learned they said i'd go home in the evening and just go away and study but literally I'd, but i'd build things like I said, push and commit my code. You know, I did the AWS Certified Solutions Architect um, certificate just to upskill myself in cloud. Then I found I was having conversations with different areas of the business and developing that rapport that I just didn't have before. And it just completely opened my eyes. So back then, I could just do some basic Terraform. But I couldn't build a whole Java or Python app or anything like that. And I wouldn't need to. That wouldn't be, I would never actually, that's the job of the engineers. But when they mentioned these languages, I'd be able to say, okay, well, what does your, you know, your, your pre commits look like? What does your SDLC, you know, I, I knew these key terms and I would know how to help them get more secure as a result. Yeah. That's yeah it's speaking of the cloud then for the for the end user of somebody that's looking to break into the industry maybe they want to pursue a, a defensive sock analyst role or maybe they want to go into to dev secops hmm. where where do they start there's there's so many different pieces of of technology hmm. obviously you've got the main three azure aws hmm. gcp hmm. where does a, an absolute beginner start so it it really depends. Now, they're all directly transferable. So if, if you type in on Google um, a kind of cheat sheet between GCP, AWS, and Azure, mm -hmm. you'll find that like compute services are exactly the same technology, um, just different names. So for example, like I taught myself all AWS, but then I went for an organization and I was leading their cloud security in Azure. I didn't really even need to upskill myself. I just straight away could navigate the console Use it like there was no, and similarly, I've had people come to me that have done Azure and straight away been able to do AWS. So actually, in truth, it doesn't really matter. I find AWS has better documentation. Uh, they're a bit better at like selling their products. So it's easier to learn and understand. And it's like playing a video game. I really find the AWS console. It, I found it a lot of fun to do and, and actually, yeah, uh, I, it blew my mind. mind. Yeah, yeah, and it blew my mind that I could almost create an entire company within a few clicks. <laughs> it was just like so nuts. Um, but yeah, so it, it, I recommend you do something that you're going to enjoy doing and maybe try a bit of all of them and, and see which one you enjoy more and then and then stick with one yeah I think that that for me has been a eureka moment throughout my career when there's things that i've learned i can see the parallels with them already and it's kind of you're not starting from square one with lots there's a lot of transferable mm -hmm. skills a lot of kind of annoyingly different product names um that mm -hmm. that, that, that you know, i still struggle to oh, yeah. remember the product names for aws yeah. and gcp i'll just describe what they do until somebody <laughs> helps me out <laughs> to find that easier um, but that's some good and so are we are we getting closer to the modern day like are we, are we where are we at when you're in your your journey now how does it diverge yeah. yes yeah when we've you got quite far charlie is what i really want to know as well, well right? yeah that, i suppose that's a whole new thing. <laughs> yeah and, but, do you know what this was? It was kind of due to the problem of the hiring issue. And what I mean by that is whenever I've gone to market to hire DevSecOps engineers, I've always struggled. Um, either the engineers are too senior and want very high rates that you can't always afford from a budget perspective. And you don't want to spend your whole budget on like one person. That might not scale appropriately. So what I've always done is I've I've kind of sat down, I've done a DevSecOps strategy, and I've gone, right, what are the skills I need to cover? And therefore hire in and i would hire individuals for example i'd hire like a front-end developer that's got no previous cybersecurity experience i might hire a devops engineer that has no previous cybersecurity experience then i might hire like a pen tester I was like so i'd hire a mix of these skills then i'd create a kind of internal training program to upskill them all each other so for example like terraform being a really good like having a devops engineer with terraform to the point where i upskill everyone in terraform which was like a, a complete game changer so yeah, that, that was a, a big component of my like hiring strategy. But what I found was, well, actually, why, why isn't there people with CVs that have all these skills that I need 
to because the way I look at it, you jump to the end. So the end problem is someone puts up a job description, a hiring manager puts up a job description, usually because they've got some sort of challenge in the organization, right? They want to, you know, improve their app security, DevSecOps, blue teaming, you know, whatever that challenge is. So I think it, the, the task is to, to look out at the job descriptions online and go try and work out what's the challenge these companies have? What's the common theme of the challenges the hiring managers have? Then how do I get the skills to prove to them that I can solve their challenges? Because that's all you got to do in the interview is just convince the person you can solve their challenges. And they'll be like, great. You know, I share my screen during interviews. Like when I'm being, you know, if I'm going for a role, I'll share my screen to really okay. prove that I can do it and deliver it. And I'll show my GitHub repos, I'll show, you know, and, and then I almost always got an offer by going doing that approach rather than just sitting there and answering questions and then reading my CV. I kind of scrap that. I go, do you want me to share my screen and I'll show you what I've done and how I can help solve your problems and challenges. That and like that gives them so much more confidence. And you don't need a degree to do that. You don't need to, you know, I did CISP. And when I look back to CISP and, and I think all those things I memorized in CISP, how much of it did I actually use in the day-to-day -day role? Like really not much of it at all. So the idea of the uh, kind of the TikTok and what I was doing was I can people can learn these skills. What are the actual skills you need to deliver in the roles of the future tech companies? So I'm very much focused on, well, actually, where does the tech need to be to help, you know, future proof what everyone's doing? Um, and then how can they learn it and where can they get it from? And it's like things like Terraform, cloud pipelines, like, you know, this stuff is so easy to learn. You can learn it for free. That is the future of tech. That's where everyone should, you know, be focusing and starting. And it's like, and then how you do the blue teaming from that side and blue teaming in AWS, which you guys cover is like, you know, it's so, so key. Yeah. People need direction, don't they? Because there's a lot of people that are really, really keen to break into the industry, mm -hmm. but choosing where they want to go and then how they like all the things that they need to yeah. execute on yeah. to, to be able to get to that end destination. So yeah, yeah kudos for you for making that. It is a Absolutely. niche channel, isn't it? The, yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. It is, it is, you know, and that, yeah, that's that's what I focus on. But even my skill set, if, if I go to organize, you know, I made the decision about five years ago when I interview, I'll ask them a couple of questions, right? What's your tech stack? What's your software development lifecycle? And do you have anything on prem? If they go, we've got loads of stuff on prem. I don't go to work for them, largely because even my skill set won't be that useful for them. And I don't think mm -hmm. I'll be able to make the biggest impact. And not only that, they need to hire up and adapt their tech stack because I'm going to be learning things that isn't going to help my future. I'll be doing tasks that isn't going to upskill myself. No, no technical debt for you, Charlie. No tech debt, no, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love what you are saying about sharing your screen in, in an interview setting and literally showing them oh, yeah. your your GitHub repo and everything that you've been working on and all your pipelines and everything like that. And it just, just reverting all the way back to the intro when me and Josh were talking about the the school community that we're building out and one of the courses is promoting this evidence portfolio pack oh, yeah. to yeah. to show to showcase literally send yeah. it or or like you said screen share show them your evidence portfolio yeah, yeah. pack and then go through some documents and say all right so in the job description it says that i need to be proficient in a in using a seam well yeah. here's everything yeah. that i know about a seam here's how it works here's how here's a breakdown here's some screenshots of me actually Amazing. working Doing, yeah <laughs> inside the tool but the amazing thing about that, and that's what's so good. So, for example, like if you were, say, we were in medicine or or law, or whatever, mm. how it's really hard to like show your screen and prove what you've done mm. to deliver the job, right? You can't actually do that in that space. Yeah. In this space, like for example, if someone goes, "Well, I don't have," you know, you don't have a, a um, experience of working in a role, but you share your screen and you show the AWS console, everything you got deployed, your pipelines, yeah. and how you do security testing on tools. How's that any different to the actual company that you work in, right? It's just your personal yeah. laptop versus sitting in an office. The technology is the same. And you can you can do free trials of loads of things and show that as well. Mm. Like you can get access to the real life experience just from home for free. And that would give me much more, if you did that to me, that would give me much more confidence that you can do the job than relying on certs and degrees. Do you see what? Because it's like, yeah, even or, if you don't have yeah or just explaining it and just saying, oh, yeah. I can do this. It's like, oh, well, yeah, 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 but can you? Or have you just crammed yeah, 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 for yeah. this interview? Yeah, exactly. yeah, I love that. It's, it's it's a cheat code, isn't it? At the end Ooh. of the day, really. Mm. Completely, <laughs> completely, yeah. Yeah, well, one wonder if you could do that in uh, in person uh, interviews, or if that's something. If you turn up your own laptop, or what? Or if that's yeah, uh, I have. Yeah, I've done it. On, I've done it on my phone before. 
So I've shown like wow. I remember when I'd, I'd set up a whole um, alerting system from like guard duty and because I knew they had problems with their kind of AWS setup. This is a company many years ago. So I'd set up automated alerts to my phone via like page duty and Slack, which you can all do nice. for free, right? And from an SNS alert from guard duty and AWS. And I literally said, look, I can show you. And I showed him my phone and showed the alerts and how I'd done it. And it was like, I, I knew I'd get the, you know, because I'd solved his problem. <laughs> that was his problem. And I'd solved it for free. You know, why wouldn't you get the offer at that point? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, drop yeah, value add screen. Really away. nice value here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the awesome. end user. This is gold <laughs> stuff. This is literally I, gold. I have sn I have snookered myself somewhere because these were all previous recipes. But it's like, no, I've decided to make thing. Literally, I'm all yeah. out now and I'm just revealing everything, all the things I've used. And it's it's the the results I've seen so far have been great. I've had some people do like really well. It's just nuts. Yeah. 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 Do you want to talk about your boot camp? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, so yeah, so I run the DevSecOps boot camp. That boot camp is the culmination of kind of everything I've said, right? What are and so it's not focused on like studying for a cert, for example, or anything like that. It is purely the six weeks is based purely on the actual technology you need. And we do it against mock companies. So I give like real life scenarios and we have templates that we do and we fill out for doing shift and security left, running SAS scans, doing things like threat modeling, all this stuff with a focus on the future tech stack as well. They learn all those skills over the six weeks. After the six weeks, we then go into a project phase, which is all part of the package where actually we build, we meet up at weekends and we build the project so we can show them on our CV. So that's very much putting together the pipelines, the repos, everything so that they have that full package. But it's actually the boot camp is actually a six month journey, right? Because you're not going to get a job after six weeks. That's just not going to happen. But those six months, I basically say, right, I sit down with every student at the start of the six weeks before they start the boot camp. I say, What's your current CV? What's your current um, experience? This is a target CV of what I think will get you a role and convince a hiring manager. Then we work backwards from that. So I create them a roadmap that they say, right, yeah, you've got those six weeks of learning, but you need to do CompTIA Security Plus between these two months here. Go away, do that yourself. There's loads of free material out there to do that. Then look at the GitHub Actions cert. Uh, and then I obviously I cover GitHub Actions a lot on the um, bootcamp. But it's essentially a six month. And like you said, like people don't have roadmaps. I provide that really personalized journey of what that looks like. because It looks different for everyone. So that they're ready for that role in six months time. That's the kind of target. But the six week bootcamp is very much about the hands on the technology and applying it to the real life job. So like, what is Saskani? How, what are the challenges you'll get in this type of role? Giving them that, that kind of experience is a yeah, big part of it. I think that yeah, Mr. Miyagi, that is a, a proper high touch approach to kind of really giving them the direction that people need. And and you're yeah. starting from the top. Is he going to trick them into to getting to that that destination from a complete different, you know, top down approach? I think that's yeah, that's what we need. I mean, it's like like even on bootcamp, you know, I teach them TCP through a handshake. You know, we cover all the basics as well, right? But there's other certs and things that will cover, you know, CompTIA is going to cover that as well when you go do that, right? And it's that that's why the boot camp, the six weeks is more focused on the shift left DevSecOps side. But I've structured it in such a way that, you know, a lot of DevSecOps material out there, you have to already be an expert in cyber or in tech, right? You don't need to be. Mm -hmm. You can go into these roles at a junior level if you learn the right skills and you, but you've also got to apply for the right organizations. Okay. So it's, so it's not just, I teach, well, this is what the text that should look like the type of organization you go to, you want it to be at that kind of SME size organization where, you know, they're going to have those challenges, if that makes sense. Um, so for example, you know, you don't, don't want to go and work for meta as such, right? Because well, a lot of their um, process is going to be really mature as well. So actually there's so, you know, I'd say like there's a good 90% of, SME companies out there that don't understand DevSecOps and could really benefit for it. So I teach my students how to target those hiring managers that have those challenges, if that makes sense. Yeah. And to get to that boot camp, they would go to TikToks, type yeah. in my name, Cyber type my name. For... Yeah, Google me, Cyber Ago Cyber Agogi, Google that, or DevSecOps boot camp, yeah. I come up somewhere on there. Yeah, yeah. There you absolutely. go. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. Nah. 
and we should encourage anybody who's interested in the development side of things who wants an auto security that it, DevSecOps is an area that is only going to get bigger and bigger as the years go on. Um, mm. It's it's something that mature organizations are embedding in every single step and everybody else is trying to accelerate their way um, um, to get in there. So, you know, Cyber Charlie, he's he's your man for the DevSecOps. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us today, uh, Charlie. I um, really appreciate you having you on and understand, and hearing a bit about about your journey. Hopefully, people can see themselves a little bit in that um, as well and think, "Hey, maybe this is the the one for me." Maybe Josh and Robbie haven't talked; they haven't captured my interest just yet. But I can really see myself uh, dabbling in 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 more of the the building side of things and shifting mm -hmm. security as, as far left as possible. It's great. Any 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 closing thoughts uh, you want to end with before we uh, say goodbye to the audience? No, I, th I think just do what you're going to enjoy as well, right? You know, it's it's so, so key. When people come to me, I say, I say what's it? if you're interested in pen testing, go down the pen test route. Don't force yourself down a route that you're not going to enjoy, right? And the same with blue teaming. If that's what you love and enjoy, you've got to go and do that, right? Nothing's quite going to quite going to do that. And, you know, like DevSecOps isn't for everyone. There's a whole, region, a whole range of reasons why. Lots of people that want to look at security alerts and do the investigation side, it's your that's the side that you guys did right you know that is that side that will always interest people so um but it's yeah it's, cyber's changed a lot i think in the last few years definitely but, um, yeah. and, it, and it will continue to change that's that's why we love it right that's why people uh that's why people keep us in jobs that's why there are more open <laughs> jobs than ever before even though there's yeah. more skilled cybersecurity professionals uh than mm -hmm. ever before it's uh mm -hmm. you know it's a it's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy really if you're looking for um an opportunity into into a new area it's, it's not going away any anytime soon so thank you very much charlie of cyber charlie um we've got robbie from empirical training i've been josh from empirical training as well and you've been listening to the Cyberspace Podcast. That's a wrap. Nice. That's a wrap.